Hello, everyone. My name is Adele. Um, uh, together with Jacob, Sylvie, and Jennifer, we're very happy to uh, give you um, an interim um, progress report on our um, data analysis um, with the data that we um, collected um, last summer and uh, during the Baltimore um, Simon Searchlight family meeting. First of all, I want to thank all of the families who participated in that um, in that study. It was a great experience for us, and we have been hard at work um, cleaning the data, extracting the appropriate information, and trying to do the first pass of some of the preliminary analysis. And we are very happy to share those results with you today. So, as just a quick introduction. Um, we we know that motor challenges are widely reported in individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, and uh, gait analysis in particular has proven to be an invaluable tool to phenotype phenotype individuals with neurological disorders. Um, and so, the one of the issues that we one of the challenges that we have um, uh, we have seen um, is that the variation in these gait phenotypes are difficult to quantify uh, accurately. And so um, it is, we, we have set out to see whether we can use some of the newer technologies and some of the newer analysis tools to be able to quantify them uh, across populations with various genetic conditions. So this heterogeneity of motor impairments in neurodevelopmental disorders um, has been reported in various domains um, for example, we have the delayed milestones that, such as age at walking. We have uh, we observed the coordination disorders like apraxia, muscle and joint issues, gait and balance anomalies, and then also um, different kinds of movement disorders, um, uh, in particular in posturing and um, motor stereotypies. And so our approach has been to try to use um, non-invasive um, markerless motion capture to be able to um, basically uh, test whether we can detect and measure gait differences within and between different groups, um, control groups, affected groups, um, and within the affected groups, different, different subgroups by calculating specific measures. And in this, in particular, we have been focusing on measures of uh, synchrony and balance. And these are dynamic um, dynamic synchrony and dynamic balance during gait. And so for those of you who attended the family meeting um, last summer, you might remember a setup like this. We had a walkway and we had five different cameras set up at different um, places in the room. And this these are the videos of um, the same um, Sorry, these are the videos of, of the same um, uh, kiddo walking and uh, being captured through different uh, angles. Um, and so what we have done over the past few months have been to run this customized um, post extraction software on all of the recordings. And we, we basically have organized the recordings, we have separated it into segments. Uh, again, for those of you who were there, you might remember that you did multiple runs of walking forward and backward, either um, for the with, with the with the participant alone uh, or with participant and a caretaker next to them. And so we uh, segmented those videos, then we ran them through this pose extraction software that we have customized. Um, and we uh, also have been isolating some of the part, uh, some of the data, in particular the parts that are um, uh, that has the individual having a, a a good run of the gate. We have been cleaning the data for issues um, due to software inaccuracies and occlusions and multiple people in the in the same frame, etc. And so what happens is that the output of these um, Pose extraction software basically detect uh, different points on the body of the participant or all the individuals basically in the frame. And we have been using some scale-free measurements, in particular these uh, four values, these four angles that you see on this figure, to measure dynamic balance and synchrony. 
So this is a, um, a general overview of the statistics of the data that we collected. We had 34 participants um, going through the recordings. We collected 170 videos. And after segmentation, almost 80% of those videos were appropriate to be used for um, uh, the gate analysis. And so one of the first questions that we wanted to answer was whether if we have two groups of what we would construe as typical, what a, uh, a professional um, such as Jen or Sylvie would construe as typical, having typical gait, whether we can tell them apart using these two measures from a typical gait. So an example of a typical gait, for example, uh, that we saw is this kiddo who is, you know, walking as you would typically expect. And this is an example of maybe, um, you know, some, some atypicalities um, in um, this participant's gait. And in this, in this um, setup, each person, each participant is represented by a point in this two-dimensional plane, one value for synchrony and one value for balance. So the question is, if we do this representation of the participants with typical and atypical gait, um, would we be able to set them apart or tell them apart um, based on these two measurements of balance and synchrony? And these are the, re the preliminary results. We basically picked a couple um, folks with typical gait and a couple with atypical. And as you can see, there is this um, there is this boundary that you can basically tell them apart based on a combination of their synchrony and balance measures. So the more that you are above this, um, this line, you have less uh, synchronous gait and less stable gait. And when you're below here, closer to zero in both dimensions, you have more stable and more synchronous gait. All right, and so the next question that we had was that how about if we apply this to two of the genetic groups that we had, and these are the two, uh, the two larger genetic groups that we had, SETBP1 and MET13L, and we analyzed all of the participants that we had for in, in these two groups, um, and this is the result of the similar analysis that I showed you on the, on the previous slide. As you can see, the trend is very similar um, in the sense that you have this, this uh, line which uh, separates the two segments of the space in the sense that if you're above this line, you are relatively less synchronous. In, you have less synchronous and less stable gait. And then what we were curious to look at were, were these participants who are closer to this line or meaning it, they are in this right region, but in, um, close to this boundary, what we call the decision boundary, or the ones like these two that are on the wrong side of the boundary for, for lack of a better word. Meaning that if we, for example, in this case, we expected or we saw, we observed that most of the set BP1 participants are above this line, but there are these two participants that fall below. So we just wanted to look at these uh, specific instances. So if we look at this particular MET13L participant, you can see the atypicalities in their hand movements. And that is what, uh, and, and a lot of swaying from left to right. And that is um, most likely what drives um, this, uh, you know, less stable gait uh, measurement. Then we have, um, this participant who had uh, a reasonable balance and uh, reasonable, uh, reasonably synchronous gait, and you can see it from the video that that is indeed the case. And then finally, there is this kiddo who had uh, pretty stable balance, but it is not very synchronous. And as you can see, the hands are very stiff, the arms are very stiff and close to um, their face. So overall, we can see that using this, this methodology and using these two uh, types of measurements, um, meaning our, our specific way of measuring balance and synchrony, we are able to see very interesting trends and extract very interesting information. Um, we also wanted to make sure that um, this particular effect that we see in balance and uh, specifically is not due to age. So we did a very preliminary analysis on age. And as you can see, age is not a big factor, meaning that um, uh, like across various ages, you still have this uh, separation of 
um, these two groups based on their only based on their balance score. And another part of our efforts during the past couple of years has been to see whether we can use these technologies to do remote assessment. There are various reasons. Um, this was, a, first of all, this was something that mostly came up or got very important uh, for us during the pandemic. Um, and so there are various reasons for why we think doing remote assessment is very valuable. One is that it is more ecological meaning that the uh, participants are in the spaces that they are familiar with. And there is uh, also a, a lower barrier of participation and easier access for families. Hence, we can get larger data sets. And we do have a prior publication that we show that over a, uh, a the course of many years, the moment that we started collecting these data remotely, we had much better coverage all over the planet and um, higher number. Uh, of participants. Um, and so that is very important in the context of um, quantifying these phenotypes. As an example, on the left, you see a video that we got from uh, one of the participants during the family meeting. As, any, as you can see, there are these atypicalities, these, you know, um, hand movements that are not necessarily typical of um, during during uh, you know during walking, and that same participant we asked for a remote video on, and you can see it on the right, and it is suddenly the person is suddenly as way more at ease, and they are um, walking uh, very naturally, and so this uh, emphasizes the importance of doing these assessments in a in an ecological way. Of course, these family meetings are very valuable to get a lot of data and being able to do a focused assessment. Um, but we also want to um, you know, point out that um, combining that with these ways of remote assessment, which is literally the one of the parents or a caretaker just pointing a camera, maybe just a cell phone, um, and taking a video of the participant walking across a room could be very valuable. All right, so these were our preliminary analyses and uh, as a way, but by the way of just uh, letting you know what we are planning on doing. Um, next, we're gonna be comparing balance and synchrony across all four groups. Uh, we are planning on calculating other measures of gait based on these post estimation data that we have extracted. We want to cross check the data quality and our analysis with other teams as well as trying to use other pose extraction software out there and try to cross check the results with those to get more stable um, information out of these videos. We definitely want to follow up um, uh, on remote assessment uh, and ask folks to send in um, videos as much as they can. And we encourage you to reach out if you're capable of doing that, that we would really appreciate it. And Another part of the data that we didn't have time to talk about today, and we are at the very initial stages of analyzing, is the parent-child gate data, which we think is going to be a, a very, um, a very exciting, um, raise a, a very exciting set of questions in terms of whether the gate changes when, for example, um, someone walks next to a parent uh, or a caretaker. So with that, I want to thank you all uh, for listening in, for participating, and for taking interest. Um, if you have any questions, please feel uh, feel free to reach out. I also want to thank all the uh, organizations and people who have uh, supported our work, and of course, my amazing teammates, Jacob, Sylvie, and Jen. Thank you.